All right, now we are going to look at a new order of insect. We're going to look at the hemipterans. So think way back to when we were doing insect systematics in this class. I very briefly went over Hemiptera, uh, and I talked about its true bug status and all that sort of stuff. One of the reasons I went over it is because there are a couple of species in Hemiptera that do cause significant animal problems. We're going to spend this series of lectures talking about those. But first things first, a quick review about the Hemiptera. So Hemiptera is the largest order of parometabolous insects. So those insects that go from egg to nymph to adult. Okay? All the other really large orders like Coleoptera or Diptera or Lepidoptera are holometabolous. They go egg, larvae, pupae, adult. So largest order of parametabolous insects and we commonly call these guys the true bugs. So Hemiptera literally means half wings. So remember Terra means wing, Hemi means half. There's about 90,000 species worldwide, and in North America, we have about 16,000 species. But of course, people are always finding new ones and reordering them and all that sort of jazz. The hemiptera include things like the cicadas, the leafhoppers, uh, spittle bugs, aphids, white flies, scale insects, assassin bugs, giant water bugs or toe biters, back swimmers, and kissing bugs. Now, this is a very diverse order, if that ridiculous list and all these pictures here wouldn't didn't clue you into it. Very, very diverse. And there's lots and lots of different types of insects to fall into this order. So we break up this order into several suborders. For the purposes of this class, this is how we're going to break this up. We're going to break it up into three major suborders, the Heteroptera, the Onchorica, and the Sternorica. So let's start with Heteroptera here at the top. This literally means different wing. So hetero, different, terra, wing. So different wing. So in this case, the forewing is composed of a thickened basal portion, and it's attached to a transparent distal portion. Okay, the hind wings are completely membranous. So you have these very strange looking wings, all different types. So the things that fall into this Heteroptera suborder are things like assassin bugs, bed bugs, plant bugs, and stink bugs. Okay, Onchorica. These are things like the cicadas and the leafhoppers. In general, this suborder are plant feeders. Uh, many of these species also produce an audible sound. So think about cicadas, right? That singing that you hear outside in the uh, warm summer evenings here in Texas. Those are cicadas and they fall into this suborder. So they produce the sound for communication. And a lot of this suborder actually communicate audibly in that manner. Finally, the Sternorica. These include insects like the aphids, the scales, the white fly. These are all really strange hemipterans uh, in here. So the name Sternorica, this refers to the, uh, the position of the mouth parts. So the mouth parts face backwards underneath the head. They're held along that thoracic sternal region in between the legs, hence the name Sternorica. All right, now, the thing about these suborders, these names are in great debate at the moment. People are talking about whether or not these are actually how this hemiptera should be broken up, whether or not these are all genetically similar enough, etc., etc., etc. So you're going to see these groups reassessed over and over and over again. And this is a relatively new uh, development when it comes to um, naming the uh, hemiptera. So... They used to be called a bunch of different things. They used to be in different orders, let alone suborders. So it's all over the map. So when you start doing different readings, you're going to notice Hemiptera is broken up in very, very different ways. It just depends on the author. It depends on the, the age of the paper or the book that you're reading, all of that sort of stuff. For the purposes of this class, we're going to stick with this classification, though. It makes it simple for us, uh, and this is what we see in your book and what we see in all of the, the stuff that I've been giving you over time. So I want to keep it all together there. So at the moment, this is what we're going to be looking at, and we're going to focus on one suborder in particular. We're going to focus on the Heteroptera, those that actually affect animals. All right, so looking at the hemiptera, and in particular, the heteroptera that we care about, 
These um, are insects that have piercing and sucking mouth parts. So nearly all true bugs have piercing and sucking mouth parts. This indicates that they feed on a variety of fluids. So certain uh, suborders will feed on things like plant juices from the xylem or from the phloem. Um, heteropterans uh, and some of the uh, other suborders will feed on animals and the fluids that the animals produce. So they can actually bite living organisms. There's about 20 species of Hemiptera that are known to bite animals. Uh, these bites can cause pain. They can cause a burning sensation. Probably this is due to the enzymes and other salivary secretions that are used for exodigestion. So these are pumped into that bite right afterwards in order to allow for feeding. Some of the larger hemipterans can actually stab in with their mouth parts, and this can cause a pain similar to that of a wasp sting because it's just, you know, very sharp mouth parts that are now being stabbed into flesh. One particular insect, the assassin bug, this is found in Israel, and it's considered the most neurotoxic and hemotoxic um, animal in that region. It's more neurotoxic and more hemotoxic than the bite of venomous snakes in Israel. So there can be some pretty nasty true bugs out there. Now, because of the huge number of species that are found in Hemiptera, the average size is just all over the place. So it's really, it goes from just a few millimeters to upwards of 45 or 50 millimeters. So that's a really, really big range for these insects. But like I said, the group is subdivided into a whole bunch of different um, uh, forms of different suborders. Uh, it's a little easy to tell certain suborders, like the half wing, that basal thickened portion, and that apical portion that is membranous for the heteroptera. Others will hold their wings in a tent like fashion over their back. Others, like the Sternorica, will have their mouth parts that are facing backwards. So you can tell them just on sight, although it does take a little bit of practice. Now, we are going to start focusing in on just those insects that feed on animals. So the hematophagous group, those that feed specifically on blood. So that word hematophagous, hema means blood, tophagus means feeding. So hematophagous feeding on blood. There is one major family that affects animals, the reduviidae. The reduviidae are commonly called the cone noses or the assassin bugs or the kissing bugs. Now, kissing bugs tend to fall into one subfamily, the triatoniomy. Okay, so these are the ones that are the major vectors for different types of diseases. They're called kissing bugs because they tend to feed around the face, around the mouth, and they can leave these little hickey-like marks behind. There are a few other hemipterans that can cause a uh, uh, effects on animals, even if they aren't hematophagous. There are things that are uh, predatory or, entomo en or entomophagous. These are ones that will feed on other organisms or, or insects in particular. And these hemipterans will bite animals if they're disturbed. So if they come into an area where you have these insect feeding bugs and an animal gets in the way, they can get bit. Uh, the saliva of these insects may have very toxic effects on the animals in one way or another. It may have things like hemolytic function. So hemolytic, this is where it destroys red blood cells. It may have hemorrhagic functions where it causes the leakage of blood components into tissue out of those vessels. It may have cytolytic functions, meaning that the uh, blood vessels or the cells will burst due to osmotic, osmotic imbalance. Or it can have neurotoxic functions, where it's going to alter the normal activity of the nervous system. So one example of this sort of reaction that we have around here is the wheel bug. So you can see that there. The wheel bug is named for this prominent spiny ridge or wheel on the dorsal thorax. Now, these are not normal animal feeders, but they are voracious predators. They feed on a wide variety of soft-bodied insects, and therefore they're very important in pest control. So if you see these wheel bugs out and about, just leave them be. They're going to be feeding on other insects, and that's great. 
Uh, they move relatively slowly. Uh, they will grab their prey and they're going to inject their saliva, which is just full of digestive enzymes and these paralytic substances into these insects. And that's going to immobilize their prey within seconds. It'll then start working on the internal mechanisms of that insect. It's going to digest it. And then this wheel bug is going to be able to suck out that uh, digested juices. Now, these wheel bugs are not normally aggressive towards humans or animals. They tend to hide from us. They tend to hide from dogs and cats and things. They tend to run away when larger animals find them. But if you pick them up or if an animal really gets involved, like a cat batting it around, then they these uh, bugs can inflict a very, very painful bite. So if you get bit by one of these, um, tell me about it because I want to know. I've never been bit. But the, uh, the pain has been described as worse than a, a bee sting or worse than a hornet sting or a wasp sting. And apparently, in general, there's a lot of initial pain followed by a numbness for just several days. So the afflicted area is going to become very reddened and hot to the touch as your body is reacting to this bite. Later, it may become white and hardened around that puncture area because of those uh, digestive enzymes. Occasionally, a hard core may just sort of slough off and leave a small little bite hole at the puncture wound. And healing can take a long while. It can take up to two weeks. And during that time, the, the wound can, can become easily infected. So if you or your animal has been bitten by a wheel bug, it's gonna hurt. Sorry, not sorry, I guess. Uh, take care of it. Put a lot of antibiotics on it. Cover it with a bandage if you can. Try to keep it from getting infected. And then don't mess with the wheel bugs. All right. With that, that's the introduction to the Hemeptera. Up next, we're going to start looking in particular at the Red Uveity. Let me know if you have any questions.